forward to it today. So as we get ready to begin, let me just open in prayer. We will quickly go through a few housekeeping bits and then we will hand over to you, Dr. Dave. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you because you have gifted us with committed servants of yours who have made the time to share with us, to build us, to <laughs> equip us, and to join with us on this journey. And today we are very grateful. We're very grateful for this time together for your children who you have called to have communion with each other as we seek to serve you in the ways that would transform our world. And Lord, we just ask that all the equipment, all the technology with, that you have availed us will just be used to your honor today. We ask also, Lord, that you will sharp more intellect, that you will open our understanding, and most of all, that you will speak your specific word to our hearts and help us to see clearly and to discern what you would have us do. So thank you, Lord, as we commit this time to you. Amen. Amen. All righty. Um, I want to, to do two things. One, by now, I'm hoping that you would have met with your group. I've peeked in and I see that you're chatting with each other and you're making plans to meet. Uh, it's a wonderful bond of learning and exchanging ideas and the, the work on culture which we've stepped out of last week does not end with week two. It goes on because I know you will be reading and you will be doing other things that will be reinforcing and bringing that back to you. And just about all the other areas that we touch on, you're going to be able to identify the cultural nuances that affect that. The other thing has to do with your personal learning community. You are entering an exercise this week in which your personal learning community is gonna be very, very important. So choose wisely because what you want to have surrounding you right now are persons who are eager to see you grow. Persons who are interested in joining with you in this, ex in, in this exercise. Persons who will understand that this idea of your, your being certified in transformational leadership is more than just an academic goal but it is a life-changing event that places a, an, a, an additional emphasis on the things you do, the way you do it, and the reason why you do it. I can tell you that there is one distinctive with BGU. If I came to boast my academic qualification, I would have lost the vision of this school. If I came to experience a change of heart about how, what motivates me to do what I do, then I have begun a learning process that I can't end. So you want a learning community that understands that as part of what you're going to do so that you are free to share your life map to share your storylines that they can listen keenly and say, you know, Jackie, you have a heart for, you have been given a special gift 
four. We hear this word coming up time and time again, and we know that you have been wired by God to do this, and we want to support you to do this. All right? You also need a learning community that will dot your I's and cross your T's and, and tell you about your, 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 your writing style and what you could change and how you could improve it. But more importantly, in my mind, you need that supportive learning environment. So get it going because we're going to be meeting with your PLCs at a time convenient to them, yourself and us. And we will talk with them about their commitment to you, your commitment to them, so that this community of learners will grow with you along the way. All right? So I wanted to speak to that in particular to make sure that your learning community is a community that you will be able to um, just work along with as you go. I wanted also to ask you, you are in week three. Are there any questions? Are there any uncertainties, anything that you would like to, to ask or share about as you go, you will notice we have been, you have been given your book report and you have been asked to do these book reports weekly. I want to say to you that you are not penalized if you do not do them weekly. We understand that you are in a dynamic environment, you might not be able to. So prior to, to now, this is the second time we've been encouraging persons to do the book reports weekly. And when you do them, it means that at the end of your program, you're not crunching eight book reports and your other recommended reading and your final project all at once. So this is why we're encouraging you to do that. You will notice this week, I encourage you to read Bill, en Bill Endrick's book because you're moving into discussions in which his book would um, add to the, the, the dialogue. And I would expect also that in your discussion, you're drawing on your reading and you're cross-referencing and citing that so that in doing so, um, we're seeing that, you know, you're, you're, you're growing from both the reading, the discussion, and your own personal experience. Um, there's a question. Uh, the fixing the time to meet with the professor begins from, say, week four down. So we want to aim that by the end of the course in week nine, we would have done all the PLC meetings with you and your PLC, myself, Dr. Dave, and so on. Um, Florine, you haven't been able to get hold of the book just yet. If you are in touch with people like um, Dr. Messiah, or even with, um, oh, there is a last student, your education, um, oh, why am I missing his name? I will write that to you. There are some persons who, Marcel, right. There are some persons in Guyana, Florine, who might well have the book. So let me quickly step aside now. And are there more questions? Gia, are you fine? Gia, are you fine? If you're responding, I'm you... sorry. Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm and sorry. I'm here. The name, and you're fine. I am fine. Thank you. Right. Um, okay. All right. Um, I do. I do have a question, um, Doctor Vaughn, on the life maps. Mm -hmm. um, I see that we got two different, like one, you know, that has like lines, and then the other one right. has the actual. It, it, it do we do purpose. both of those? No. 
And you don't okay. have to do either. Because in your oh. creativity, your life map could be a spiral. Okay. It could be a, a launch of one of those rockets going out of, you know, the sky, you know. <laughs> the idea is that it is it is doing what it's supposed to do in terms of mapping your growth trajectory spiritually, emotionally, as it is suggested there, all right? Okay, and the last question that I have is um, I'm having trouble getting all my group members together, so we haven't made really progress, and I'm just not sure what I can do. I, I've tried messaging, right. but I just don't here, know. You know, here is, here, here is what we can do <laughs> at the end of this session. If your group members are in here, I am prepared mm -hmm. to stop the recording and allow okay. you to just go together. All right? Okay, if, thank you. Raise your hand. Um, here we go with the technology. Oh, yes, I have a question. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah. My question is on the, on, on the book reviews. Uh -huh. um, I'm not quite sure about the other. Are you expecting um, any of the book reviews weekly, or do you have um, like an order in which you want a specific book in a particular week, or oh, just okay. any of the books? I, I, there isn't a specific order. We bear in mind the fact that you're expected to have read 50% of the books before you came to the class. And for those persons who have done so, then they may already have a good four or five book reviews. The good thing about submitting the book reviews, though, is that you will have Dr. Hurt giving you feedback. He's the man about the book reviews, right? I want you to, to, to look very closely, though, at what the syllabus says. In other words, prior to BGU, a book review that I read in a journal or in a newspaper had nothing to do what BGU is asking of us, right? So do not do a book review if you're a journalist in the way book reviews are done. Do not journal if you're someone who always journals in the way you would journal. Write each of those with your with your syllabus looking closely specifically at what you're asked to do right taking time for pre-saying so if it is a 500 word maximum then 700 does not give you added grade and is not a good way of obeying an instruction all right the other thing to do too is that as you read, it is good to cross-reference your work. You're being asked at this point um, to show the intellectual discourse that cross-reference what you're reading in one book with another, right? And show how all of them are coming together. So if you get to that stage of your reading you might not be able to do it in your first or second because you have not read a lot of the books just yet but as you go along and you see the synergy between them and you're able to see how one supports the other still restricting yourself to 500 words all right and then it shows the intellectual discourse so while you, your professor might be asking strongly for intellectual discourse in terms of how you are supporting your, your perspective, how one book challenges or support the other, I also want you to be very specific to what each section of your book report asks for and the number of words, restricting yourself to the number of words in the book review. All right? Thank you. I have been recommending the books. So if you have them, say for example, we're going into 
the whole thing of life map and we're really doing an, 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 an internal look. We might be struggling with so many things. I have been sharing some of what I've been reading with you. Then you might want to look at, say, Bill Hendricks now because we are talking about him. And we're talking about some things he will be talking about when he comes on to be with us next week. And I should tell you, my response from him has placed him next week Thursday and not Tuesday as we would normally do. His best day is Thursday. So as I got that response not so long ago, I want you to eco out Thursday at five o'clock next week for your presentation from Bill Hendricks, the author. All right? And as I get ready to hand over to, to Dr. Dave, are there any other questions you may have regarding what we've been doing so far regarding the course? Dr. Hurt, is there anything that you would want to share? You're here with us. Nothing specifically, but I would reiterate that uh, on your book reports, you really don't want to let them go too long because um, it's uh, it will be a painful experience to try to get uh, get book reports done and try to get all of them written at the same time. So I, I would suggest uh, make an effort at, uh, at keeping track of them uh, and uh, and getting them in on time as, as much as you can uh, just just to keep the uh, keep the pain away of of having to do a lot of book reports over the course of the weekend. Thank you, Dr. Hurt. I want to share with you something I read. I have been grading um, the last semester. We had a strong um, and a, a very memorable course, um, personal assessment course. But I'm reading um, one of the um, papers presented and it is so relevant to what we're going to do today, and particular to persons who are saying, my God, I did an overture. I did um, joy at work. I don't need to see another um, life map. But it helped me when I read this, because this, this student said, I find that every time I tell my story, I discover new insights into God's goodness to me, the gentle and fierce love he has for me, the kind ways that he has led me, a very willing sheep to become a man who is enthralled with his love for me, and so growing in my love for others. I found that so powerful, I thought it was a good way. Um, Dave, to hand over to you. Thank you for being with us and thank you for always being willing to share. Over to you now. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you, everybody. Um, it is always a pleasure to be able to tell your story and to to talk and learn from others. Um, I want to warn you, first of all, like I said last week, uh, I'm not going to lecture. Uh, I'll tell a story. I like stories. You've already been reading a lot of, of academic books, uh, discussing, having to think uh, intellectually quite a bit on concepts and theories and so on. But this is a personal assessment course as well. So part of personal assessment is to be able to reflect back on everything that you're reading and learning and digging deep into yourself and figure out how has all of this uh, impacted me? What has God done in my life? What is he doing and, and where is he taking me? One of the, the uh, main foundations of BGU is that it's a, we're, we're transformational people and this is a transformational leadership course. 
or, or degree. And, and what I've learned over the years in my business and my personal life is the more I am personally transformed, the healthier I am, the more impact, I, a positive impact, <laughs> I, just, I need to qualify that, positive impact I have on others because we all have impact, we all have a severe of influence constantly. And too often, if we're not aware of our own issues and our own toxicity, we can have a very negative impact on others and without even realizing it. So um, this course takes a lot of personal reflection and thinking back, how did you get to this point of where you are now? So I wanna share a little bit of my story and hopefully that will open up things for a good discussion on some of your stories. Uh, but first of all, I don't, I don't wanna make an assumption have, since the course just opened up Sunday for the life mapping, how many have actually had a chance to do the life mapping exercise? And this isn't a quiz. I just don't, if you haven't had a chance to do it, I want to I want to explain a little bit. Uh, so has anybody had a chance to do it yet? No, for the most part, no. Is, is that correct? Okay. So thank so, you for saying yeah. Has anybody had a chance to do it? So this is all brand new. Okay. So that helps me because I didn't want to make assumptions and start talking about life map if you don't have a clue <laughs> what I'm talking about. So the life map exercise that, that Dr. Brad Smith came up with, you, you basically have five H's. And he calls them the hard times, the high times of your life, the heroes, the heritage, and the hand of God in your life. And it's really a, a fascinating, for me, it's been a fascinating experience. And Yvonne brought up an overture course. The first time I did a life map was I was in Ghana, you know, Accra back in 2010. And I had gotten to a point in, in my business life, my spiritual life, my family life, where I hesitate to use the word crisis because I feel like my whole life has been one series of crises. <laughs> Does anybody else feel that way ever? <laughs> Amen. <And> so, <laughs> In so, Jamaica, we say, may I have a weakness? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when, I, when I'm looking at this life map, and they were talking about the high times, the hard times, the heritage, the hand of God, et cetera. When I drew my life map, it was kind of funny because there weren't a lot of, of high times. I've had high times. I mean, going back to my childhood, I had a few hard high times. Um, when the Lord got a hold of me, I had some pretty significant high times. But it seemed that especially since I've really sought to see God and everything, I have more hard times <laughs> than high times. And I've always wondered, is there something wrong with me? I mean, why is the spiritual life seem to be often so difficult? And I want to share a little bit of that, my background, so maybe you can relate. And maybe I'm not crazy. Maybe I'm not the only one that's experiencing this kind of a life. Um, Maybe I am. Maybe we'll get to the end of this time together and you all say, yeah, Dave, you're crazy. Um, that's just you. And if that's the case, okay. I, I can live with that. <laughs> but I tend to think that's not the case. So um, just a, a little bit of a background. Um, my family has struggled with alcoholism going back several generations. Um, my, my grandfather died um, on the streets of Chicago as a ho homeless person. And my father um, would, act, would actually take him in, into his home, in the middle of the winter in Chicago, which we're in the northern part of the United States, it'd get very cold. And in the middle of the night, he was, my, my dad was newly married, uh, had three little girls, and their house had a crawl space. They didn't have a basement, they had a crawl space underneath it. And he would sometimes, my mother and my father would hear rumblings underneath the house sometimes in the, in, in the middle of winter. And they'd go outside thinking an animal was crawling underneath the house. And it, was, it would be my grandpa trying to find a, a place to keep warm. 
that and I as as a as a dad myself, I can't imagine what my dad at, at 23, 24 years old, what that was like to pull his own father out who was who was a drunk, you know, and he's just looking for a warm place to stay. And they would take him into their house. My mom and dad would they'd clean him up, put him to bed, dry him out, um, get him sober. And that would take three or four days, and then he would disappear back out on the streets again. And when I understood that as an adult about what my father dealt with, with his father, it helped me understand my father's struggles with alcohol. And he did really well as a father considering what he had to start with. And so growing up, alcoholism on both sides of our family was very, very uh, common. It was my normal. That's all I knew. So the first time that I was actually drunk was eight years old. I was at a, a family wedding and some of my cousins thought it would be fun to see a little boy get drunk. So they actually, I thought I was getting orange juice and I was getting orange juice and vodka. And that kind of started a long, uh, kind of a journey for me where I, by the time I was 15, I, I had a severe drinking problem. And by the time I was 18, I would consider myself uh, probably an alcoholic. Uh, and, uh, and in our, in our small town, we have more bars than we do gas stations. And our state is consistently ranked the, probably the drunkest, <laughs> it sounds funny to say it, but it's probably the drunkest state in the United States. Um, the amount of drinking that goes on, it's very, very typical. When my dad started the business, he would actually have a quarter, a quarter barrel beer, a keg in the lunchroom for the employees for every night after work and during lunch. Uh, there was pornography throughout our whole business. Um, that was my normal. So by the time I was 19, I was suicidal. I was a drunk. I was working in our company business, which was a machine shop. So it's, it's a dirty, dark, dangerous. It's a typical factory. And at that point, the you know, Lord got a hold of me and kind of plucked me out and, and just gave me a whole new sense of purpose. And, and it was kind of a road to Damascus experience where uh, all of a sudden I knew I was here for a reason. And I won't share all the details, but that was a pretty high time when, when God rescued me from all of that. So my first question, and I think it's, it's a probably obvious question, um, when a young person has that kind of experience and they really want to serve God and they really say, okay, I, I, this is all that matters to me, what's a typical career path that young believers go through if they're in their late teens or early 20s, if you really want to serve God, what do you end up doing? I was going to put seminary. that question. What's that? Seminary. Yeah, seminary. Yep. Mm -hmm. What else? And why, why seminary? What, what's the, what's the tra career trajectory? Uh, to become a minister to, you know, or Bible college or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. You, you either are going to become a youth pastor or a uh, yeah. church pastor, missionary, or, or something like that. So that it was the direction that I, that I went in. I had a burnout experience as a pastor in a church. And the ironic part is uh, I, I have a mentor who, call, who uses a term that God often calls us back to the scene of the crime. And that took me a while to understand what he meant, but Calling us back to the scene of the crime for me was calling me back to my hometown here in Wisconsin. I had moved to California. For, I kind of ran away from home <laughs> and uh, swore I'd never be back. I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere in the world, but just don't, be, don't send me back to this machine shop um, because I thought I needed to be a pastor or something. But after being in a, in a, in a church for a while, um, that's not me. So, I wrote, so the funny thing is, I ended up going to seminary <laughs> because people still said, oh, you need to go get a, you still need to be a pastor. You're, you're, you have a pastoral call. So the, my wife and I moved up to Regent College in, in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. And we, uh, the second year, I'm still trying to figure out what to do with our lives. And the second year I took a course of that, that analyzes kind of like a personal assessment, but it's like, what's your career path? What are you gifted at? What's your experiences? What's your temperament? What, what are your skill sets? And 
the, the, all the assessment came back and, and it actually said, you are uniquely gifted to run a small family run manufacturing business. And I screamed when I saw that. So I said, Lord, I'll do anything else, but do not return me back to Wisconsin in the family business and all that dysfunction. We ended up coming back. And I actually ended up doing my master's studies um, on that. And the question for my master's, and I got the, I don't have it on screen, but I can read it to you. Um, the question that Paul Stevens, I don't know if any of you know Paul Stevens helped me craft was, in what ways can a Christian manager affect the relational health of a family by addressing the overlapping systemic factors of family and business in a time of generational transition in a small family owned and run machine shop? Basically, if you brought Christian values into a company, what effect would that have on the whole company? And what effect would that have on the family? And being 28 at the time, I thought, this is going to be fantastic. We're going to usher in the kingdom of God. Everybody's going to be excited that we're back, and, and it's just going to be joyous. It's going to be a little heaven on earth thing. Can anybody guess <laughs> what happened? Based on your life experience, you probably all have a, can probably give an educated guess of what, what the experience was like. The very opposite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it was the very opposite. Um, I had to fire my sister, um, which was incredibly painful for the whole family. Out of our entire 17 employees, 16 of them at some point within the first year told me off and, and and were angry at me. Um, anytime you try to bring cultural change or change of leadership in a family or a business or organization, you're going to get, and, and I had to study a systems theory, you're going to get sabotage. You're going to get um, people that are just angry. They don't want to change. Uh, they're going to just freak out for whatever reason. And that's, that's what happened. And I thought, the, I thought it was going to be a piece of cake. And, the, and I said last week, uh, you know, the first two years is, you know, again, pardon my language, but the first two years were hell and then it got worse. And how could it possibly get worse? Well, by year five, um, I was completely burned out. I had my staff, I didn't feel trusted me. Um, we had hired some employees and, and nothing seemed to work. It was just rebellion everywhere I went. By year 10, I'm thinking two to five years was all we we're going to be. By year 10, um, I took my wife, Tracy, and who Vaughn has met. And I think, Leroy, did you ever meet my wife when you were in Dallas no. last time? No, when I was in Dallas, I think I only got to meet you. Oh, I think that's right. Yeah, in the board meeting. Yeah. Well, if you know, if you met my wife, she's very charming. Um, she's very sweet. And I found out later, uh, she told me that on our 10th anniversary trip that uh, she was going to leave me. Um, and that was at the 10 year mark. And I'm just, and, and I was a horrible father. The anger, the stress, everything was just, it was just unbearable. I wanted to run away from the family business. I wanted to figure out what God would really have for me. And it seemed that every time I tried to run, the message was clear you need to stay. You need to stay in this company and see it through. And, uh, <laughs> so five years turned into 10, 10 turned into 15. And by the time I got to Accra, Ghana and, and was with BGU, I think I was in year 18. And I was in a, that class where we did the life map. And basically you map out your whole life, the hard times, the high times, you know, all those things we talked about. And I, I absolutely came unglued and, and in that overture class and just sobbed and sobbed because the journey seemed so hard and at times, and it wasn't just a one month journey or a two year journey or a 10 year journey. It had been 18 years since I had felt called um, to really seek God and everything that I do. And yet I felt like I was sequestered away in this little family business that I never wanted to come back to. So my, so the, the point of all this, <laughs> it's like, why am I telling you all this? I am still trying to figure out in a lot of ways why things happen. And maybe it's a wrong question why things happen. But I don't learn very much from my high times. 
I don't know if, if that's just me. When things are going well, I don't remember a lot of the life lessons that when things are going really well. I remember the hard times. I remember the painful times. I remember those times where I, I was absolutely at the end of my rope and I needed, a, so I needed either God to intervene or someone to intervene to help bail me out of the situation I was in. And so my question um, that I want to ask people and, I, and I, I, I wrote this down as well, to, to help you reflect a little bit, because I think this, is, and it's gonna take some vulnerability um, on your part, to, and I hope you're willing to share, but as you reflect back on your life, and, and this is really, we're trying to build community in this course, and, it's, and we, we wanna be honest and open with each other, but that's, I think, when we learn from each other. But how has, how has God used some of your hard times um, to shape your calling and to bring you where you are today. Um, because for me, being in this business for now 27 years, I'm finally seeing some sense of, it, of why I'm here. And, and I might share a little bit later tonight, uh, you know, what is happening in the business and, and what we're doing with young people. And, and the miraculous part for me is God brought me back to the scene of the crime and yet, I would have never, ever thought in my life that I would say being here in this office right now in this company would be my safe place, would be the place that I think I'm going to, you know, probably, I don't think I'll ever retire. I love that much what I, I love what I do that much. I, it's not, it's still not that easy, um, but God has taken this horrible place that was my, you know, the worst place on the planet and turned it into something that I just go, wow. Um, I, I just love being here. And that, and, and I told someone recently, I told my wife actually the other day, I said, you know, my safe place is at work. And she, her eyes has got, she was that, that is a miracle. That's only a work of God because there's no way that can happen um, on my own strength. So before I share more, I, I'd love some comments or feedback and can anybody share an experience of how some of your hard times have brought you to where you are today? Would anybody like to volunteer? I will absolutely volunteer. Hopefully you all can hear me. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, sometimes I have to walk in really the hard spaces to really take note of the hand of God and, and, to, and to really hear him. Um, you know, unfortunately, it would be so easy just to say, I hear him and I can respond really quickly. <laughs> and, and, right. I mean, that would that would make this walk so much simpler. But that's just not been the reality for me. Um, years ago, I was I was uh, in law school and was bound and determined that I was going to be t become an attorney um, and then eventually, you know, a judge like my uncle. And uh, I was in the third year of law school. I was struck and severely injured by a drunk driver who had no insurance. Um, it was his fifth or sixth drunk driving offense. Um, we had to hire an investigator to track him down for what? I don't know, because he ended up not being able to, um, you know, do anything in terms of kind of repairing what, what had been broken. And um, as a result of that, I experienced this uh, lengthy period of time of um, anxiety where I couldn't get in a car. Um, I was afraid to, to drive. Um, you know, I, I was in the house. I, I just, I couldn't go anywhere just because of the fear. And so I wasn't able to finish law school like because I couldn't get in a car. I couldn't. And they're like, well, one thing or the other has to happen. Either you have to come to class or you're going to need to call it a day. And in my anxiety, I said, it's, it's got to be a day. So I called it. And it was both a sad decision, but in, the, in that time, I felt like it was the best decision. Now, whether it was or wasn't, you know, who knows. Um, so years later, I'm married and we're, we're having our third child and I 
finished my morning devotion. Meanwhile, you know, these student loans are stacking up and, and uh, I'm completed my devotion and I go to walk out the bedroom. And as I walk out the bedroom, I get right under the archway of the door and the Lord just speaks to me and he said, daughter, I've called you to counsel my people. And I said, what? How could you not have told me that before now? Lord. And I spun around still under the doorway. I spun around and marched my way back into the bedroom and got down on my knees. Lord, this isn't right. This isn't fair. And he said, daughter, I, I did. I did tell you. You just didn't hear me. You, you didn't hear me. And I was completely a wreck because I was like, father, how did I not hear you? How did, how did I, one, this was not something I wanted to do. So I could, you know, it was easy to say why I could not hear like a counselor, a therapist. Absolutely not, Lord. That's got to be the most boringest job ever. I need something with some power and authority and some, lots of money. And that was the driver. Um, but he shared with me that he, he, he was speaking and he had been speaking and I didn't hear him. Fast forward now, uh, however many years later, 30, whatever it is, something years later, I am so appreciative that I get to walk in who God has purposed me to be, you know, and I am my best me when I'm doing this work. And this, as you talk about your safe place, man, I love to come to my office and I can sit here and work and talk to people and encourage and, and share all day long because it's, it's just like flowing in the element, you know, now that I'm, now that I'm here, but it was, a uh, a hugely difficult experience getting here. And I have this huge financial debt that looms over there because I chose to not hear. I wasn't in a place where I could hear and respond to the call of God and to, um, you know, do an about face and, and go in the direction that he had really purposed for me, not Adair's direction, God's direction. And, you know, so I have a constant reminder uh, of, my inability to surrender to God's will, um, you know, early, early in my life. But I'm glad I'm here now, though. Absolutely, wouldn't trade this for nothing, nothing. So those hard times really, uh, those hard times made you appreciate where you're at now. Then, ooh, absolutely. Plus, there's so much joy in doing the work. Yeah. You know, there's so much joy at you know sharing the gospel in this way and seeing lives changed and just there's so much, I, this is the best job ever and it's not even a job it's i'd do it for free if i had to because there's just so much joy that i have because i know that the work of the holy spirit's you know present and moving in the lives of people to bring health and healing so i'd do it for free sometimes i do so you know, I, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. That's powerful. Um, Dr. Dave, um, that joy is so evident that I get a mail. Um, Dr. Yvonne, what time is this going to be? Because I have to see my patients. And I could understand the priority that was placed on that day. And the joy is evident. It really is. Yeah. Powerful. Thank you. Who else? Yeah. Um, Dave. Hey, Terry. Yeah. Let me share a little of my, my hard times. Um, I left home while I was six. Um, to live with my uncle, um, who was um, very poor. But my dad was, at that time, uh, well-to-do. I wouldn't understand why my dad would want me to go and live with an uncle who has nothing to feed wow. and to live in that has a lot. So I couldn't understand why. I felt it was unfair to me. But living with my uncle for about six years, 
Um, it was a tough one because um, sometimes we might not have one day meal to eat. I'll have to trek about um, uh, two hours to school and two hours back. And then when I come back, I have to go to the farm um, before we come back to eat. So it was tough. And living with an uncle um, who had about seven children for himself, uh, anything go wrong in the home, the blame would be me. Um, there was a time the wife lost one of her babies and they felt I, I was one that killed the baby. I was accused. I was um, um, dealt with, uh, but I kept staying kept saying, you know, my dad would call and ask, what, are you okay? I kept saying, I'm okay. Uh, but those times, I, I didn't know God was preparing me for my call in the future. Um, I learned discipline uh, there because he was a military man. I learned um, to be very hardworking and to uh, go the extra mile to make sure things happen. I learned how to be honest, learned it from that home, even in the, in, in the midst of the oppression, in the midst of the battering. Sometimes I have to sleep on a bench while others are sleeping on the phone. You know, sometimes I have to be punished for what crimes I did not commit. <laughs> you know. uh, but after a while, when I left to go back to my dad's house, I discovered that I was different from my other younger ones, my about 11 younger ones I have. I was different. And my dad could trust me with his um, uh, money. So my younger ones know if he keeps it very carelessly, they will pick it and finish it for him. But I was so disciplined that to be there, I cannot touch it because um, of where I'm coming from. So those hard times, those uh, times of oppression, those times of rejection, God was using it to prepare me for the future as um, to be a pastor. Um, so when I came, the only, the only problem I had with my dad was that I love football. I go out to play football in the morning and come back in the night. <laughs> at soccer, and that was the only issue I could have with him because any other issue, if I felt I was a, a priest already, but then I was not even born again, I'm not even giving my life to Christ. But he felt I'm too good to just be somebody that is not born again, that I'm a priest. He keeps saying that you are a priest, you are a priest. I keep saying that to him that I don't understand why I want to be a lawyer. I can't be saying I'm a priest because he will say, because your lifestyle is different, you know. So till today, I thank God for those times that I went through my uncle's place. And rather than have a hatred towards them, I thank them for that opportunity uh, to, to, to learn. But a time came also, my father also went down to poverty because he was a politician, everything crumbled he had. And we had to face, the whole family had to face hard times again. And um, I could pull through with that because I already had experience, but my younger ones could not. It was, it was so shocking to them. It was devastating. And at the point, we had to go and live in uncompleted buildings uh, where there are no windows, no doors, uh, just open that way. At the time, the owner of the uncompleted building came. I want to renovate. We have to move. Uh, we had to scout with a friend. Um, two wives, one husband, and 11 children. I had to stay in a small room. <laughs> um, uh, there, my dad died because of too much of thinking, too much of... Um, he died out of stress, out of attack. And I had to faint for the entire family. I had to work in construction sites to take care of my young ones so I could not go to school. Um, 
I dropped out from my law degree. I had to drop out. But all that, God was working out uh, my call for me. I didn't know. And my dad died a year after I gave my life to Christ. So I was angry with God. I was not happy with God because how can you allow my dad that the time I have surrendered my life to you? Uh, it was a disappointment to me. So I actually backslided uh, and left the faith because I was hungry. But thank God for a particular friend of mine um, who kept coming to me, who kept talking to me. And say, I eventually went back to Christ and then I saw that there was no other, no other uh, way I could, I could make it in life than to go the God's way. Um, so that those shaped my understanding of life and ministry and my calling. Um, in the area of my calling, I, I, I gave my time to music, music ministry, uh, for singing and uh, dancing. Uh, when the time came, the Lord spoke to me and said, that is not your call. I was like, this is what I've learned since I gave my life to Christ. This is what I've been doing. This is what I have passion for. But somehow the Lord was saying, that is not what I'm calling you to do. So that was a time of confusion for me uh, that I could not understand. At the point I said, well, I won't even go into ministry because um, uh, my dad suffered and died uh, in Nigeria then in the 80s and in the 90s, to be a minister is uh, synonymous with um, poverty. Uh, if you say you want to be a minister of the gospel, they will ask you, you want to go for poverty, you want to choose the life of poverty. So I said that I will not suffer in my lifetime and also suffer uh, in my career or in my calling. So one day something happened that I will never forget. I went somewhere to buy petrol station to buy fuel, and I packed where I am not supposed to pack. But I went with my pastor's car. I packed where I'm not supposed to park. And these law enforcement agents were deflating the tires of all those who parked where they are not supposed to park. And I was approaching the car. One of the um, gang members around that area so I was telling the policeman that don't deflect this car because the owner is the pastor. And at that time, I have not even answered God about the call. So I stood there, I was watching them. <laughs> so the police, the law enforcement stood up and said, okay, he left my car because a gang member who don't know me from anywhere, I've not met him before in my life. I does not even know who I am. And he was just saying, he's a pastor. And the Lord told me, that is my voice from somebody who uh, I can tag as a sinner. But God used that person to speak to me. That was my turning point that I accepted the call to be a pastor. Uh, so since then, um, when I face hard times, I know that God is teaching me a lesson and preparing me for the next phase of life in the future. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's my little story. Oh, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that, Tammy. Just this morning, I'm going to share my screen real quick because um, <laughs> this is, this is uh, the scripture that I actually wanted to bring up to you all, and you just did it for me, Tammy. Um, this is in Hebrews chapter 12, um, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children, right? And the part that, and, and I, I did bring this up just to share for you all today. This was what God was speaking to me about this morning um, because of some of the things that I'm going through right now. And, you know, I, I skipped down to verse 10. You know, our fathers disciplined for us a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in this holiness. And no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained, uh, trained by it. That was important to me this morning because I'm 55 years old, and I know we're all different ages, but, it, but we are often, when you're in a course like this, 
Brad, Dr. Smith talks about convergence, that we are reaching a point in our life where God has, has invested perhaps decades into our life, preparing us um, for maybe what he's calling us to do now. And I had a hard time, on, and I still have a hard time understanding that. But every once in a while, he breaks in and he goes, I prepared you for this time. Look back on your life. And, and I think it really takes eyes of faith to be able to look back and go, wow, that was God's hand, even in the death of your father, the, the being sent away to live with your uncle and being falsely accused and all of these things. And, and I think for all of us tonight, um, that's part of the, the reflection process is of being able to, to look back and see those times that were painful, that we were angry, that didn't make sense and go, was that the hand of God in my life? And uh, I think overwhelmingly the answer is often yes, if not always yes, but it's hard often to recognize that. So thank you, Tammy, for sharing that. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but would anybody else care to share? I am noting, Dave, as, as, as the sharing, the different ways in which we become aware of this calling. You know, Adair is under a doorpost and she's hearing something. Um, Tommy's having someone speak into his life who is not a holy man of God and a prophet known to the people, um, but just someone who is delivering a message he must pay attention to and how we must be open to this message when we hear it. And in a class like this, at a point of convergence, something is going on that is also speaking into. And the idea of being sensitive to and hearing becomes so important. Well said, Yvonne. Well said. Anybody else like to share? If you don't feel comfortable sharing, let me ask a different question. Um, I always reflect back to what I'm going through at any given time. And over the last year um, in my own life, it seems God's bringing me to this place where I'm supposed to have even a bigger sphere of influence with uh, people in the community, people in our family. I have, uh, with all the pain in our family, all of a sudden I have three nephews who for the most part have disowned me uh, for most of their lives. And all of a sudden this last year, they've all come to me and said, we need they, they said, Uncle Dave, I, I need my Uncle Dave. And they're young men in their 20s. And all of a sudden, they're asking for, they want a relationship. And I've been longing to have a relationship for, for years with them. And all of a sudden, there's this movement in their hearts that they want to connect, which is, which is an amazing thing. Um, also, professionally, uh, with the business, with BGU, with uh, some other things I have going on, um, it seems absolutely overwhelming. And I don't know if anybody ever feels absolutely overwhelmed. <laughs> that's, that's where I live a good part of my life. Because um, some of my, my own insecurities, my own issues, my own need for significance, my own need for approval, all of those things, I keep finding myself in situations that I'm going, Lord, how did I get here? Was this you or was this me? So the first question is, do you have... Any, do you, does anybody else ever have those experiences where you find yourself in situations you're going, how did I get here? And was this me or God or both? And I'm asking you because maybe you, you can help me <laughs> figure this out. <laughs> Dave, 
Yvonne, I'm going to start yep. asking you to call on people if someone doesn't yeah, speak yeah. up. <laughs> and I'm going to call. I'm going to start. Oh, there's Jackie. Because Jackie just turned off her mic. Okay, yeah. her mic. right. Okay, Jackie, um, go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, uh, I I posted in the um, online chapel, but what I found is that. I mean, we all go through hardship, different types, family, personal, professional. Um, but what I found is that all my hardships have taught me empathy mm. and um, forgiveness and a, a good way of understanding what other people experience and how, how to be how to be a better listener, less judgmental. I mean, it, it took a while to get there because for every hardship gives you a different experience. So um, when you're going through it, it seems rough and tough and you say, oh my God. Um, I don't often ask why because um, I know there is a reason what you want to do is see the end of it <clears throat> but in all my years it's the empathy that um that has really settled my mind that i'm able to just today um i'm doing i've been trained as a mediator so i had to do some observations today and there are two young men 15 and 16 who came with their parents one young man he's fifth one young man chopped the other one with a, a machete or a machete, as you might call it. And, you know, one father was saying, I need compensation, $30,000. And you saw that the father, he had control of his son. The other young man came with his mom. Um, he was out of control. She was very weak. She, she couldn't manage him at all. But uh, my heart just bled for both boys when I looked at them. Because the young man who chopped the other one, he, he was so polite. And all I could see in my heart was that this young man just needed a role model. And all he wanted was probably love and guidance. Um, so it's, it's um, hardship for me is about learning so much. Uh, because every day something hits you over. When you're in business, something hits you. You know, people say things, people write things. Um, but you just learn to let it be. Um, you learn to let it be over time. Yeah. Anyway, that's, that's what I have to share. Jackie, I appreciate that because that resonates deeply with what I'm going through and learning. And it, it's, it's like the Lord keeps coming back to me. And, and, and it's also the sense of dependence. The hard, the hard things come every day, like you said. How can I learn to appreciate and look at those as lessons and look at God as a father saying, this is an opportunity for you to learn more and to grow more. And even though I'm 55, I'm like, well, how much more do I have? The older I get, the more I realize how much more I have to learn. Yeah. I feel like in some ways I'm getting dumber. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome, welcome to the club. I am, I am reading, considering that I feel that I am the the oldest here, but I've been have been drawn to a book I read forty odd years ago, <laughs> and the book is not even in an electronic print, but it's Philip Thatcher being human. And I just want to read one excerpt because I'm struggling um, with the selves. When we get into an environment like this, I, I believe we have the public self, the one we feel safe to present. And that's okay. It's the one we want persons to believe that we are. Yeah. And then we also have the gut self, that part we're not disclosing. Yeah. And yet it is when we find a community in which we can be true to the self yeah. 
that is that God self that we really begin to feel free. And I'm mm. finding as you get to my age, you probably gain the strength not to want to be Dr. Hurth or to be Dr. Etaj or to be Jackie um, in her business, but to stand in the self that sets you free. And I think Philip Thatcher says it nicely when he said, genuine honestly, honesty, be it mm -hmm. intellectual or emotion, mm -hmm. has tremendous power to free persons, to be persons. But mm -hmm. sometimes this happens at the cost of some degree of personal agony and our reluctance to pay the price often inhibits our willingness to be honest. We're afraid of being hurt, of being rejected by others because we say what we think or show how we feel. Perhaps yeah. especially so when we try to be honest on the feeling level. Mm -hmm. There are many, in fact, who have little difficulty in being honest about what's going on in their heads, but are terrified of being open about what is happening in their guts. Yet, how we feel about something or someone is every bit as important as what we think. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I don't want to cite the example he used, which is a racial example, but it clarifies it for us. But why am I introducing that reading now? I am understanding that we're doing something that um, seem not very academic and very, you know, needed and necessary, but it becomes something that opens the door to a growth path when we're ready for it. And the point of readiness may not be now for some of us because our public persona is very important to us now and we want to live that until. But there comes a point when the two need to be one and it is in that space that we find the freedom to truly be who he has ordained us to be and who we're called to be. I just wanted to add, um, you know, it's a lot to think about. I think that's kind of part of the, the quietness is thinking about, you know, our sufferings and thinking about um, the hardships, you know, that's hard sometimes. Um, to relive or to think about but i think for me um what what keeps me you know from getting angry with god when i go through difficult situations or you know because there's a lot of things that could just send you over the edge right that is like i'm just done with this whole trying to please god thing you know we all have been there at some point um but i think what keeps me um what what balances me is understanding that you know if i'm to fully embody christ um, then I have to share in his sufferings. And so, you know, everything, um, and, and, and to also understand, to balance that with the fact that he's a good father. And I think that's constantly what I have to remind myself. What, as a mother, would I do this to my child out of, you know, why would I do something that's harm, harmful or hurtful to my child? And so it helps to keep me sober in that regard and to always see him as Abba and to understand that his thoughts toward me <laughs> are always of good and not of evil and that even when he's disciplining me or trying to produce something in me um that again is for a purpose it's not because he has nothing else to do um and i think for a long time i saw god as this evil ruler you know because of what was hand down um you know or passed down generationally that i saw him as this ruler but i was not in relationship with him and his love and so now as a mature believer i understand that his love is first and foremost and so I can receive the suffering in love. I can receive the rebuke 
in love. I can receive the no <laughs> in love. Um, and so that's just where I am, and it doesn't make it any less painful. Um, but I'm currently reading um, The Making of a Leader um, by uh, Dr. Clinton. And, you know, as I was reading last night, it really, um, I had to sit there and really reflect because as he talks about kind of the various points in a minister's development, you know, it forced me to look back um, over some periods that I didn't have clarity on. Like, why did I go through that? Like, why, why did I have to endure that? Um, but it, it helped me to understand, oh, that, that was development. Oh, that was sharpening me. Oh, you know. And so that book has been really helpful um, and it's caused me again to reflect on things with a new level of clarity um, because hindsight is always, you know, 2020 and we're able to see the big picture. But I think, you know, um, it, it's, it's all about development and it's all about making us better people. Um, and so if I have to go through, you know, I listen to Adair's um, situation and I listen to all of the hardship and I'm like, man, that's, I have nothing to complain about, you know, getting hit by a drunk driver or going through some of the hardships that my brothers have gone through over in Africa um, and, and things like that. Um, but it's all purposeful. And that's just what I have to continue to tell myself, that it's all purposeful. And at some point, because <laughs> we know in part, right, and prophesy in part, and at some point it's going to make sense. And so I just have to trust his leading. That was powerful. Thank you so much. <laughs> that, that, that helps me. I mean, I really appreciate that perspective. Because as I get older and older, it's like, okay, like I said, I, I reach points where I think I'm mature. And I think, okay, I'm, I'm, I've got my act together. And then God reveals something else. I'm like, oh, man, I got so much more. <laughs> <laughs> but, the potter's wheel, the potter's wheel. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and it's, it, it's that, and I, and I think it comes back to having that relationship with, with, with Abba, with Papa, you know, having faith that he does everything. We are in training. He, are, we, he wants us to be better people. He wants us to be free from our addictions and our obsessions and all the other garbage in our life. And he's constantly working to do that. And, and the, the incredible thing is he keeps doing that. We become that much more of a vessel for his kingdom. And, and we become not because we're academic, not because we have our act together, but because we're healthier people. And I, I had a situation um, in the last few years here where I, I got pretty ill and I had to cut back from work for three years. And, and my, staff, uh, my staff actually said, when I lead less, I lead better. And they were being nice about it, but what they really meant was, when you're not here, um, we're a little bit more free, <laughs> and things aren't quite as toxic. <laughs> and and I had to take that and go, yeah, okay. So what kind of person am I really? And now I've come back three years later, and and now they see, I, I think for the most part, a different part of me. Even my own sons have said, in the last, and my wife, they said, Dad we don't know who you are because you are just so much more different than what you were. And, and it seems that process is never ending of learning and growing and being stripped down and learning some more. So yeah, I appreciate that perspective very much. Thank you. And Dave, just one more thing. Yeah. Um, I think just blending it with what we dealt with last week, culture, how we were raised. I mean, how I was raised, was that my mother would always say to us, if you listen to somebody else's problem, you'll be happy to take yours and keep yours yeah. because God knew what you could handle. Mm -hmm. So don't complain. <laughs> so our culture and how we were raised also, I think, determines how we manage hardship, high times, low times, all the time. Maybe it's bad that we, maybe we internalize it or do we see it as a, um, do we cover it? Do we just hope it will work itself out? But that is how we were raised that, you know, when you listen to other people's problems, you take yours up because God knew what you could handle. Well said. Thank you. Our history too, Jackie. And exactly. Which is intertwined in culture. Because yes. persons will um, ascribe to even my ability to bear pain. 
which, yes. which it surprises my doctors. Right. With my maroon heritage. Exactly. And for yes. those of us who know of the maroons and just yeah. how um, cor courageous they were in the midst oh, yeah. of battle and just oh. how they never gave up, then yeah. I, I, I am seeing, not because I want to, but I am seeing that in me in a way that I keep saying I will die standing. Yeah. You know, so I think too that something came with that middle passage. Yeah. That yeah. has impacted how we deal with it. But Felicia, yeah. I am looking at you. Are you okay today? I am not seeing the 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 the, the bright glow coming through, but Let's hear from you. How, what yes, time yes. is it? What time is it where you are? Uh, it is six twenty-one right now in the morning. Yeah. So, but you're coming awake. <laughs> oh, yes. Yes. Definitely today. I think I'm so much more awake than the last class. I think the last class, my my brain was just dead, and you know, I was <laughs> just listening. I couldn't even be be expressing right. myself well. Okay. So yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's. You know, this, this class has just been so, to me, it's so enriching because, and, and just to hear everybody's story is like, you know, um, to me, I always feel like I have a, a I, I struggle with uh, processing my thoughts um, and to actually express myself. I actually process my thought better when I write. But, you know, I come from a very different background in the sense that um, I actually do fear success from God. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't think, I don't seem to really struggle with knowing what God wants of me um, because I think I hear him very clearly, but I think I struggle to want to embrace it fully just because every time um, when I feel like there is success in what I do, God brings me to another place. And it's like starting all over again. And that itself is so tiring for me. I, I mean, I've come to a point in my life where I'm like, I'm just physically tired. You know, so it's like, okay, I think I just do not want to excel anymore. I just, just, just maybe just do it enough and just stay there. You know, so, so yeah. So I guess I'm trying to process what it means. And of course, the last draw was, being kept here in Malaysia, then going back to the U.S. You know, I thought, God, that, I thought this is what you want me to do. I have, um, you know, and I love it because I actually um, was very, very, um, 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 I, I participate a lot with my senior pastor to turn over a church that was at the hems of just closing down within one and a half years from 35 people we had in the church and we had up to 180. And, um, and it was not just the numbers. It was the very fact that people were, were growing. They were coming alive in their faith spiritually. Um, things was just going very well with the whole thing in church. And I thought, wow, you know, thank you, God, you know, that you allow me to participate in such a, a, a wonderful work that you are doing in, in the life of the people. And the relationship that I've built with everyone in the church, every single one from, you know, from, from the 89 year old right down to the three year old. I love it. I love them so much. And then, you know, thinking that I'm just coming back here for a three weeks weekend, you know, bringing only one luggage home and never was allowed to go back to the U S it's like, okay, you know, God, you know, just as I thought we, we have got to do more when I go back, it's like, you're stopping, you know, it's like, I'm stopped in my tracks again. And this has happened all the time in my business, at the helm of my business. I feel like, okay, God is uh, allowing me to walk away. But at the same time, it's like, I would want to walk away. But at the same time, it's like, you know, why is he opening the other door for me? Which seems to be just what he has called me to do as well. And then feel like, okay, I have got to start all over again. But there, there was also a conviction that, you know, I should be moving. So every time when I reach that success, I feel like, okay, God is just giving me that choice to walk away 
And the other choice is always seems to be more like what God wants me to do, right? But this last draw was like, okay, God, I totally, I mean, going through the first two times, I was going like, okay, maybe it's, it's not God, it's me. You know, although it looks very much like what God has opened and, you know, I have that, that, that peace. So this time I was going like, okay, God, you know, maybe this time is really not you. I've always walked away from success. What does this all mean? You know, so right now I'm like at the point where, oh my God, this whole work that is starting down here seems to be very, very tedious. Um, yeah, so I'm just going through that, that, that stage where I am just tired. <laughs> Yeah, but also trying, I mean, I know it's very purposeful. I know that I'm still in the, the will of God, but it's like, okay, where else is this going to? Like, you know, I, I, I see the lives change. I see the good work, but uh, I don't know. I, I do not know whether I'm trying to reach a destination or I'm just like, you know, whether God is actually just trying to just um, test my faithfulness and obedience. Yeah. Dave, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, Beth. Felicia, I, I resonate again with everything you're saying because I'm at a point right now again where I am afraid of success. And part and that's part of my family background. Our dysfunction is as soon as you're successful, um, our family would put you down. You're not allowed to be successful. You know, that was a dysfunctional uh, of an alcoholic home. So I, now with this whole convergence, and I would say all of us are probably in a similar place, God has invested decades in each one of us, right? I see, I hear your story, and I don't see, okay, you're having to start over. I see God going, great, she got that task, she accomplished that, now let's notch it up a level and make her even more uh, influential and healthy and even more of a, a, a force for the kingdom. But it's exhausting. And I'm in a place right now, I'm just like, Lord, I, I would rather just walk away a lot of days and, and go. I love the wilderness. I love want to go in the wilderness. But he's making it clear that, no, I have this other way for you. And you have eternity to rest <laughs> and to relax and enjoy. But, but I have this lifetime for you right now. And so the challenge for me is, is always reflecting back. Because God does give us choices. And so what often helps me is I, I go back and one of the fun exercises I did recently was I did a life map of, of the life of Joseph and trying to understand as a child getting sold into slavery and rejected and, and, and totally turned, you know, sold by his own brothers, what kind of family baggage did he have? And then he's in prison and he gets, you know, all these experiences and trying to, to, to track and understand how he felt through all those times. And yet he remained faithful, and yet he remained you know, righteous, and, and God kept trusting him with more and more. And I, and I think in a course like this, we can talk about these things because it is an amazing privilege to be in a doctoral program and to be taking these courses. But the responsibility along with that is that God is shaping us and preparing us, and he's with much responsibility He's going to expect more from us. And with that exhaustion, the other side of it is that relationship where God wants to draw us even closer. Instead of expecting more and more from us, he said, if, you're going to, if, you're going to, if I'm going to use you to accomplish more, your capacity for me needs to be greater. And so I think as he wants to use us more, he puts us in these situations that we cry out and we say, God, I need, if you want me to go this direction, I'm going to need more of you. So hopefully that that's that's the lessons I'm learning and struggling with right now. Yeah, I guess I guess that's what I need, you know. I feel like sometimes I feel very alone in this journey. Yeah. 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 Can Thank I you. can I just add the that um the tired? Yeah. The tired is so much part of the the, the 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 journey and the the tiredness comes to from what our own expectations are for this point in time versus what we're faced with and whether it be a combination of 
in some of us physical ailments because it's that time of our lives when we're not as young as gear right now, right? <laughs> or it is also where we expected our ministry to be handing over and handing off and in the middle of it he's saying create whatever but the tired to his purpose i remember the last week of my work um in my my lifelong occupation a young staff was would gotten to the top without one hundredth of the work it took me to get to the top looked at me and she said you work hard but you don't work wisely hmm. i've never forgotten it because it took a long while to understand it hmm. but i want to also throw it at you felicia that God, I don't think God is calling you to be exhausted. And Dave would have learned that too. And I'm mm -hmm. learning that. Because mm -hmm. he will put us out of commission just when all the work is there to be done. And, and watch things happen without us. Because the world doesn't stop when we fall off. Right? And so it's not, it's to see how he has positioned you to be what he wants you to be, empowering others along the way, preparing them to take the baton as against calling you to be weary and to carry the load of the calling, right? And maybe part of what you will work through in this personal assessment course and make it important is to understand the call in the context of your role and I do not think we have a God if we look at the life of Jesus, who would not be disappearing when his disciples are asking, where were you? The sick have been asking for you. The dying have been asking for you. But he had gone to be strengthened. And we're going to go into a, a, a space of spiritual formation which is not really how many times you read your Bible and, and that kind of stuff, right? A lot more. But as you build in this course, understand too that he took 12 disciples, 12 people that didn't make sense, right? And not 12 intellectuals and not 12 whatever but 12 guys who would be all foolish when he left and disperse and give up. But what he had poured in them was to last and what he's poured in you will last and he's not letting you go. So, you know, you're working through um, what you've been called to do. The end of this nine weeks, one thing I would encourage you and would like to see you place in it is how you are going to see yourself as this precious child of God who he wants to be safe, healthy, relaxed, happy, content, mm -hmm. wrapped in his loving arms empowered and empowering others right because he has all of that for you amidst the pain and the disappointment and you have to take it up you have to plan it you have to make the decision to take it 
because that becomes your outlook, not his plan for you, but your interpretation of the blueprint. And Ivan, Felicia, what I've also learned over time or seen with, you know, my own struggles is that people, God puts people in our lives and sometimes we're not seeing it. And relationships are so important. And we're so busy sometimes trying to do this, do that, what, we're, what we believe that we're called to do alone. But the relationships and the people he puts on our journey, um, that's something that I've learned to stop and look at, smell, you know, really look. And it, it, has, it has made me, um, my life easier. In, in terms of seeing or resting. Because in, you know, in my early life, he was, he was always just going, 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 busy, busy, busy. Um, but it's about resting and looking at who he has put in my path or around me. Um, people who have always been waiting are just, they want you to use them, they want you to, they want to be involved, they want to grow as well. Um, so it's about, I think, resting and looking around and engaging and managing relationships for our own growth and for others to grow but you know that's my my own part of my journey you know these are some really great uh comments and uh um it it, it keeps bringing Dave's comment about convergence to mind, because I see a lot of that in my life as well, uh, where at each stage I look at, uh, if you looked at my resume, my detailed resume, you would, you would wonder what I've done with my life because it seems to be all over the map. It's, uh, it's um, the, the military, it's teaching, it's, it's the corporate world, now it's higher education administration, but uh, uh, whenever I take that life map approach, I can uh, I can really point to how everything uh, comes forward and uh, and converges on, on that spot where I'm at. Uh, but uh, one thing that that jumps out at me, especially this this past Sunday when we were looking at the book of Nehemiah, is that uh, it's it's uh, it's both uh, God working in, in your circumstances and working on the people around you, uh, and also you working to prepare yourself for things. Um, so, in the first chapter of Nehemiah, uh, the the king notices that Nehemiah is is sad, and he asks Nehemiah what's wrong, and Nehemiah explains to him about. Uh, Jerusalem is torn down and he's grieving and, and he really wants to go back and build it. So the king says, okay, fine, Nehemiah, go back and rebuild Jerusalem. And at that point, then Nehemiah gives the king a shopping list. He, he says, I need letters of passage, I need lumber, I need all these people. And the king says, fine, you'll have them. But, but the point of that is that it's clear that Nehemiah and probably some other, some other of his uh, colleagues have been doing a lot of thinking about this. And so they were prepared for that point when, it would, when Nehemiah was asked by the king, Nehemiah had a shopping list ready and he knew what he needed the king to do uh, to help him out. And then uh, when Nehemiah got to Jerusalem, one of the first things he did was uh, he went and inspected the city and, and they started making their work schedule and doing all those things. So. So there, there's a lot of Nehemiah acting in uh, in that account, and so, so when we when we look at back at our lives, there, in in addition to the high points and low points that God uh, puts us in, we we can also look at uh, the things we've done and uh, and ask ourselves, uh, maybe we didn't intend to do it, but it still prepared us in some way to uh, you know for this particular moment. Yeah, really well said, Leroy, because, you know, the, the point of this course, and Felicia, I appreciate your vulnerability sharing that, uh, what you did. If we're going to be, as I said earlier, if we're going to be really 
powerful vessels, you know, for whatever God's calling us to do, the first thing God calls us to is to himself, right? He's not nearly concerned, not nearly so concerned about what we can accomplish, but who we are and who we are in relation to him. So as, as Leroy was saying, as, as we move forward, we, we need to keep looking back and dig inside and, and really analyze things from perspective as who has God been in my life through all these different transitions? And where is he bringing me to now? And what does that relationship with him look like right now? Um, one of the, the passages of scripture that drove me crazy for several years is when, is when Jesus says, all you who are weary, come to me <laughs> and I will give you rest for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And for several years, I go, Lord, I don't see that. I don't get that at all. And, and we were very involved in Honduras working with the rural poor at that point. And I actually went down to, a, to a Honduras and asked our teenagers who were youth mentors, who felt, I felt they were much more spiritually mature <laughs> than I was. And I said, y'all, you need to explain this to me. What does this mean that, that his burden is easy or his yoke is easy and his burden is light? And we had a fantastic discussion, but, but what they helped me really understand that I keep going back to is every time I'm feeling ex exhausted and burdened and overwhelmed, it's always God calling me back and saying, how are things between you and I? You know, and, and it's always him digging in and saying, you know what, again, I don't care what you accomplish. My most precious moment is spending time with you and helping you grow as a person. Um, <laughs> So I think we need to remember that. It sounds like he's asking you and I, Dave, do you understand that I can get this done without you? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so I, I want to be sensitive to everybody's time. Um, so Ivana, I, this has been a fantastic discussion and there's so much wisdom in this class and I so appreciate people sharing. And I know a few of you are, are, you know, like Abraham, I can sit and I can look in your eyes and I can see you mulling over things. <laughs> I'd love to hear your thoughts someday and same with you, Sagoon. Um, I look forward to some of the chats um, and the discussions because I, I know some of you, like you said, you, you uh, process your thoughts by, by writing. So I do look forward to reading some of that. So Yvonne, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Dave. And please forgive me for not coming on video. Um, but I'm really here with you, heart and spirit. I'm happy also that we did this early in the week because I knew we would have had like persons who have done overtures and, um, and I think it also, the life map comes up in your joy at work course. So if you've done those courses, you've, you've done it. And I wanted to introduce to you uh, another look at it, another look at it, this time, not so much as a polished academic exercise for your classmates to see, um, you know, there are two sides. We can say that we've, we've suffered the most or we have achieved the most, but more so to be reflective in terms of what we're seeing and as Felicia pointed to in a very strong way I find that the life map leaves me asking God what would you want me to do what would you want me to do not because what I am doing is not what you want me to do but because sometimes even within what I'm doing, there's a subset that the change is within me, that with God working in and through me, I can still be doing what I'm doing, knowing that I am in his calling, but I am transforming myself he is transforming me in a way. I am open to his transformation in a way that I become just a 
deeper discerner of. And um, I, I change sometimes the value I place on some things. And, and right through this week, the value that I'm placing on this is the prayer for the heart to see, to understand, and to be fed. And may all the books that you're reading, whatever it is that you're doing this week to fulfill the requirements of the class, minister to you in a way that you you feel that closer connection with the call that you are clarifying during this course so god bless you i don't want to close if was there anyone who had something burning to say um I would want to give you the opportunity to do that. No, then, you know, Abraham, I'm going to ask you to close us out in prayer. I'm not going to let you go silent today. Okay, I'll be glad to do that. Okay. All right, let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We really appreciate you for all the wisdom that comes together as we share this evening. We thank you for your loving kindness. And we particularly thank you for the various experiences that you have allowed in our lives. We give you glory in the name of Jesus. And we ask that, Lord, as we progress in this course, grant us to also, Lord, to really understand more of that which you are bringing to our hearts. Grant unto us the wisdom, Lord God, that we need to be able to understand you more. And help us, O oh Lord, particularly to be sure of our calling and to abide therein in the name of Jesus. We pray that, Lord, as we progress, lead us, grant our teachers, Lord, grant unto them, Lord God, the strength and the wisdom required in the name of Jesus. And in all, O oh Lord God, let your name continually be glorified in this class and in our individual lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Abraham. Sigan, I know, you, I, I, I think you're home. Because I know that at this point you travel home, but you look from your picture that you're home. I hope you heard us well. Yes, I am. I'm home. Right, right. Yeah, I know yeah. you would have been traveling. Um, mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. Thank you for turning out. Thank you for sharing. I hope this was an experience that was worth um, attending to. And I, I'm really inviting you to read, to get into this, the, the discussion and to, to, to add to the discussion from your reading so that for those of us who may not have read something as yet, we begin to get a taste of what is happening in the various books that we're all reading, okay? Because that too, um, lifts the level of the discussion as we interact with. We practice proper citation along the way and we just get better at, you know, as, as I often say, just saying, hi, hello, I agree with you is not a response, right? But we're furthering the discussion when we respond sometimes adding, encouraging, and um, leading um, the person to whom we respond to other material and information. Our culture, our, our way of doing and seeing things, all of this makes the cross-cultural communication rich. So feel free in your response to others 
to add your perspective because that's how we're going to see the world as a melting pot where we understand what we don't right now. Already bless you all. I had promised a dare that um, I would stop the recording and allow you to continue to speak to your classmates, if at all possible. And I don't know if this will work, but um, Adair, who are your group members? You mean, I have to speak uh, away, everybody. I gotta go, so. I think uh, Adair, it's a- uh, Thank you um, so much. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you also, Leroy, because you may have to go too. I will have to stay because I, um, the, the, if I leave, we may end this session. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you, everybody. I know you haven't attempted to get home yet. No, I'm at the office. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, okay Good bye. Night. Bye. So, Dr. Yvonne, it, so it's, um, it's myself, Jackie, Felicia, I thought it was uh, myself, Jackie, Felicia, I thought it was Shania, and... No. Melissa, I think. It, oh, Melissa. that's right, Melissa, yes, Melissa. So Jackie, myself, Melissa, Felicia, all the A's, all the A's, um, and... I thought I thought there was a guy in our group. Melissa, uh, Melissa, are you there? Can you speak? Is this group three? Yeah, I'm here. Right. Mm -hmm. We haven't heard you speak at all, uh, and, and I'm just realizing that. Okay. All right. So, um, is it possible for for you guys to arrange a meeting time? Um, does everybody here have a Skype? Is Andrea. it our group or is it Gia's group? Mm -hmm. No. Group? Yeah, that's what I was confused about because I know I asked the question about it's, not being able to meet with my group. I think oh, it's Gia. Oh, oh, it okay. wasn't a dear. It was, it was. It Gia. was Gia? Oh, okay. It was Gia. All right, Gia, who are your group members? And one. Florine, okay. Who else in guest group here? Do I log in to see? Okay, I'm signing off, you all. Have a good night. Okay. So, good so night. your group is okay, Adair? Yeah, I think we're okay, right, Jackie? We're just nailing down our, our day and time, and Melissa. Oh, all righty. Saturday, see you a good day. Sorry, could, we, could, could I just do a quick one, uh, Adair, before you leave? I think we're meeting this Saturday. Yeah. Yeah, so we just need to nail down a time. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, I, so you will so have that discussion. You will have that yeah, let's talk offline. In, in the group, uh, your group chats. I want everybody to be, you know, corresponding with each other in the group chats. I have been linking it so that what you did last week is still visible. All right, so each week I link okay. your group chat so you're not losing any of your chat. But okay. um, but okay. let's go to 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 Gia. Gia, are you there? Gia. Okay, guys. Bye. Who are you? Bye, everybody. Bye. Who are your group mates, Jill? Can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, your group mates you're not able to connect with, are they? Yeah, it's uh, Florine, Sh Sh Shanika, I, I think Shania. that's Shania. Uh -huh. Yes, I'm sorry, Shania. Um, uh, that's all I can remember off the top of my head. All right, I am going to um, just just send a, a mail around to all the other um, persons. Shania is not here. Florine, you're hearing, right? Yes, so you, yeah. you will want to get into that group chat and just um, respond to Jill so that you can yes, get- I have, I have said that I will be, I think Friday is a better day for me than Saturday. 
But I know that we haven't um, been able to connect with everybody. All right. So um, get in there. Guys, I know the guys are all together, and I did put Africa and that, that side of the world together so that you could get your timing in sync. Are you okay, Abraham, Tammy? Yeah, I think we're okay. Well, yeah. All righty. Um, well, well, please, please get. Um, I, I can be assured now that your group is, is, is okay, right? Yeah. I am going to get in touch with Shania and ask Thank her to, 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 to join the group, the group discussion, um, just so that we can have it all worked out. All right. Yes. Um, is Gabriel still on the call? Huh? Gabriel. Say that again. Is Gabriel still on the call? Uh, no, I have a feeling that I'm going to have some persons withdrawn um, because okay. they have not attended just yet. Right? Oh, okay. They oh, have no, not come true. in. So whoever is in your group who you've seen have not attended since the class started. Just okay. pretend that you don't have them. All right. Oh, okay. So it's right. Just I think of withdraw, us, yeah. right. I think withdraw and look if you see when you look at the roster, if you see okay. withdrawn beside his name, I think he's withdrawn. Gabriel is right. Francis, right? I think Okay. All right, that's fine. Then that's three of us then. All right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye right. everybody. Bye. 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 Bye